Hi everyone. As the name of this lecture suggests, by the end of today, we will finally be ready to move forward to really start getting into the capital M modern period. Starting next week, we'll follow Columbus and other explorers like Magellan and Vasco da Gama and trace the development of the first phase of globalization. That may sound strange given that the word globalization really doesn't enter the lexicon until the 20th century, and even then it doesn't really enjoy widespread circulation and usage until the 1980s, something you can see for yourself by doing a simple Google engr engram search of the term. Before we do that, however, we have several loose threads uh, that we need, loose ends that we need to uh, that we need to tie together from Tuesday, relating to the development of Christianity in Europe, the proliferation of the humanism of the Renaissance, and the development uh, toward the modern bureaucratic state system of Europe from the old system of mostly patrimonial kingdoms, fiefs, bishoprics, free cities, etc. We have a lot to get through today, and uh, I want to leave a good amount of time for discussion, so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, we'll begin with the first thing I mentioned, Christianity. Christendom had been suffering splits and dissenters from, for some time before Martin Luther. Some of the disputes were doctrinal, others were political. And I would emphasize that trying to make broad, that trying to make broad generalizations about why Christendom failed to produce anything like an Umayyad caliphate is something of a fool's errand. There's a good book by a historian, uh, Scheidel, uh, that looks into why this failed to happen and why, in his, in my own opinion, the development and maintenance of political polycentrism in Europe was the key to its long-term success. There had, for example, in the 11th century, been the Great Schism, the division of the church into Catholic and Orthodox. Not long after Luther registers his protest against the church, King Henry VIII of England will break away, creating the Church of England in the process. As far as dissenters who predated Luther, but who essentially were registering similar complaints, there was John Wycliffe, an English theologian and Oxford professor, Jan Hus, a Czech priest who was actually burned at the stake as a heretic by the church, uh, Peter Waldo, a kind of forerunner to the Cathars. Uh, against whom a vicious crusade would be waged in the south of France in the 13th century. Uh, and then there was uh, the Italian uh, Savonarola, a 15th century Dominican friar who was also executed by the church for his troubles. These men criticized various aspects of the Catholic Church's hierarchy and teaching, such as the authority of the Pope and the doctrine of uh, transubstantiation, for example. They also questioned the wealth and corruption of the church, particularly the practices of selling indulgences, that is essentially paying for grace. Generally speaking, they almost all advocated for a return to biblical authority and translation of the Bible into vernacular languages so that more people could read it. Because you see, unless you were educated and could read Latin, which was highly unlikely, Europe at this time is, is basically preliterate, something we're going to talk about more in future lectures. But so you, you as an ordinary person couldn't read the Bible, and you were entirely dependent upon the religious authorities to tell you what it said. And uh, when you know it, the Catholic Church tended, as a rule, to emphasize some passages more than others. For example, many were shocked by passages such as Mark 10.25. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You don't say. Uh, these men paved the way for later reformers like Martin Luther by questioning the authority of the church, advocating for scriptural authority, and calling for reforms based on their interpretations of Christian teaching. Now, how the Reformation caught fire and why Martin Luther receives the prominence that he does is because of the intersection of these theological disputes with geopolitics. Because while you're all doubtlessly familiar with the story of Luther's debates with the church, being good Protestants, you're probably less familiar with why Lutheranism was adopted by the North German princes, who then protected Luther from sharing the fiery fates of Hus and Savernola, among many others. First, Martin Luther's teachings in the Protestant Reformation resonated with some German rulers and intellectuals who were critical of the practices and doctrines of the Catholic Church. Luther's emphasis on salvation by faith alone, the authority of scripture, and the priesthood of all believers appealed to those seeking true religious reform. These were seriously religious people and societies, after all, to an extent that it can be difficult to appreciate from today's vantage point. Uh, second, though, was their desire for autonomy, because embracing Lutheranism provided the North German princes of the Holy Roman Empire with an opportunity to assert their independence from the authority of the Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Emperor. By adopting Lutheranism, these rulers gained greater control over religious matters within their territories, reducing the influence of the papacy and the emperor, who was almost always a Habsburg. Uh, relatedly, uh, some North German princes saw the adoption of Lutheranism as a means to consolidate their power and strengthen their rule. By supporting the Reformation, they could expand their authority over church lands, clergy, and resources, because, of course, the Catholic Church held considerable wealth and owned vast amounts of land in Germany. Princes saw an opportunity to gain economically by seizing church properties and redirecting wealth to their own coffers through the process of secularization, converting church assets into state-owned property. This was a temptation 
even uh, thoroughly French monarchs, um, Catholic French monarchs might succumb to, as uh, Philip the uh, Fourth of France had done a century and a half prior, when he seized the Templars' vast wealth in France and arrested all its top leadership. Uh, the king's coup is alleged to, to have been carried out on Friday the 13th, which uh, is one of the sources of that particular superstition, because, uh, yeah, that was definitely an incredibly unlucky day for the Templars. But uh, I digress. One of the things that made the German princes feel secure in their actions was that Lutheranism uh, spread very quickly and for obvious reasons. Um, not only uh, for its emphasis on the vernacular biblical translations, which were popular among the, the common people, making the religious text more accessible, but also because they eschewed the church's worst practices, such as the sale of indulgences, which had always outraged everyone. These factors all contributed to the gradual adoption and spread of Lutheranism among the North German princes, leading to the establishment of Protestantism as a significant religious force in the region and shaping the course of the Reformation in Germany. Being relatively small and powerless compared to, say, the French or the Habsburg domains, the Protestants created leagues of alliances with each other, larger powers such as Sweden, and this led to a series of wars fought really not so much over religion but over geopolitics, using religion as basically a pretext. This isn't to dismiss the sincerity or beliefs of those involved, only that these beliefs did not present, prevent, uh, you know, like the French king allying with Protestants when it furthered France's interests. Now, the most destructive of these conflicts was the Thirty Years' War, as I hinted last week. Well, from 1618 to 1648, it was a complex conflict uh, that originated from a combination of religious, political, and territorial disputes across Europe, uh, particularly within the Roman Empire. Um, it, it had a series of phases, but the war began as a continuation of tensions between Catholics and Protestants stemming from the Peace of Augsburg, which was uh, concluded in 1555, which had been supposed to have established the principle of cuis religio, eus religio, Latin for whose realm, his religion. Essentially, it was going to be up to the rulers, or it was supposed to be up to the rulers, to determine the religion of their territories. Disputes, however, arose over the interpretation and implementation of religious freedoms. This conflict was fueled by power struggles among European states seeking to increase their influence and control over territories within the Holy Roman Empire, which, as you can see from your slide, or if you just look it up, Google a picture of it, it's an absolute mess. I mean, it's it's highly, highly fragmented. The conflict began with the defenestration of Prague in 1618, when Protestant Bohemian uh, nobles rebelled against the uh, Catholic Habsburg rule. Uh, essentially, they were rejecting the ascension of Ferdinand II, rightly suspecting that he planned to crack down on Protestantism. And this triggered a series of events that escalated into war, with Protestant states, including Bohemia, Saxony, and certain German principalities uh, forming the Protestant Union to defend their religious and political interests against the Catholic Habsburg and their allies in the Catholic League, pretty much essentially Spain. The war had four main phases, as I previously mentioned, the Bohemian, Danish, Swedish, and French phases, each marked by shifting alliances and the involvement of various European powers, such as the Swedes and the French. The war brought widespread devastation, including military atrocities, famine, disease, leading to significant loss of life and the destruction of cities and infrastructure across Central Europe. I've seen estimates that as many as 8 million people were directly or indirectly killed as a result of this war. The Peace of Westphalia in 1648 marked the end of the Thirty Years' War and established new political and territorial boundaries in Europe. It also laid the groundwork for the modern state system, recognized religious pluralism, expanded to include Calvinism along with Catholicism and Lutheranism, and the war's conclusion brought about a very fragile peace. Very fragile. In fact, the Anglo-Dutch Wars were to begin just a few years later. Um, hmm. While it's, uh, it's too much to say that the Thirty Years' War marked the end of religious warfare in Europe, there will never be, a, uh, again, this kind of insane bloodletting, even superficially, over religion. That is until the 20th century uh, and the new religions, nationalism, communism, fascism, etc., uh, as prophesied and uh, insanely glorified by, by Nietzsche. But on that cheery note, let's, let's jump now from the religious to the secular, because from the combination of the influence of the Renaissance and Protestantism, a revolution in thinking is going to be undergone. I'm talking, of course, about the Enlightenment, some of the major figures of which uh, I have a picture of on the slide on Blackboard. Before I talk about why I think it is these two things, the Renaissance and Protestantism, specifically deserve credit for this, let's, let's briefly sketch out what the Enlightenment was. The Enlightenment is kind of a catch-all term. Uh, meant to capture what was a diverse intellectual movement that spanned across Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries, encompassing varieties of ideas and principles. For example, reason and rationality. Enlightenment thinkers emphasized the power of human reason as a primary source of knowledge and believed in the application of rational thinking to understand the world, challenging traditional beliefs and promoting progress in society. Uh, this was, uh, to say the least, uh, quite a break with the past. 
Uh, the first person up on the slide here uh, is Galileo, who very nearly gets himself in some serious hot water for suggesting that, in his opinion, it seemed like maybe uh, the Earth might be the thing moving and not the sun. Uh, this emphasis on the centrality of reason and rationality led to further developments of ideas like empiricism and scientific inquiry. Building on the earlier work of people like Sir Francis Bacon, who had articulated an early philosophy of science prior to the period, the Enlightenment promoted the empirical observation and scientific methods as ways to acquire knowledge. This emphasis on observation, experimentation, and evidence-based reasoning fueled scientific discoveries and advancements in various fields. Coupled with the Enlightenment's focus on the dissemination of knowledge to empower individuals in advanced society, progress, uh, projects like the encyclopedias and the spread of literacy were seen as crucial for social progress. Regarding this idea of progress, Enlightenment thinkers generally believed that it consisted of increasing levels of tolerance achieved through education, reason, and the dissemination of knowledge. They were skeptical towards established institutions and traditions, including religious authority, and instead stressed the worth and agency of the individual. This is the period when ideas regarding human rights, personal freedoms, and the importance of individual liberty emerge. This emphasis rather naturally found expression in political theories, ideas like the social contract or the rights of individuals, and questions regarding the nature of government, arguing over which were the best forms of government and generally advocating for ideas like constitutionalism and checks and balances. These principles collectively challenged the traditional authority of the church and monarchy, paved the way for the development of modern democratic ideals, and laid the foundation for the cultural, scientific, and political transformations that occurred in Europe and later influenced societies worldwide. Now, why do I think Protestantism and the Renaissance deserve a lot of credit for this? Well, on the one hand, the advent of movable type and the mass literacy fostered by Protestantism, which demanded that you learn to read the Bible and form your own relationship with God, had the effect of rapidly spreading literacy in Europe. It helped foster this growth of literacy at the same time it placed the individual at the center of religious experience. Protestantism is fundamentally radical in the sense that it rejects hierar hierarchy and authority. Meanwhile, the Renaissance was also embracing the creative spirit of the individual, embracing experimentation in art and the physical sciences, as we talked about already, and introducing European intellectuals to the classics of the Greeks and Romans, some of which have been lost for centuries and were only reintroduced through the work of Islamic scholars or a handful of monks operating in distant places like Ireland. Rediscovery of these old texts, which lionized the republics of Rome and Greece, were to fire the imaginations of political theorists during the period. One of my favorites, and who I neglected to put on the slide for want of space, Montesquieu was heavily influenced by these examples, in particular a Greek historian of Roman history who wrote extensively on the Roman constitutional system of government during the apogee of the Republican period. I bring that, and that was Polybius. Um, I bring this up because it was highly influential on Montesquieu's spirit of the laws, which he enumerated the separate, separation of powers, those checks and balances, which would inspire James Madison when he sat down to essentially author the constitutions of Virginia and later the United States. Before closing, let me introduce the cast of characters uh, who did make it on my PowerPoint slide here, apart from Galileo, who I already mentioned. Um, there's Newton, famous for his theories regarding motion and gravity and for his invention of calculus. So yeah, thanks a lot, Newton. Uh, I just, of course. He's actually credited with simultaneously uh, and separately discovering it uh, with a continental fall by the name of uh, Leibniz. Uh, so that's curious, almost as though the conditions for the emergence of the idea had come. Um, so, uh, but again, I digress. Beneath them are John Locke and Rousseau. Uh, the former in his theories regarding individual rights and uh, would have a significant uh, influence on, on the development of American uh, political thought. And the latter with his uh, idea, this is Rousseau, the general will had a huge influence on, on certain aspects and certain political uh, theorists of the French Revolution, which we'll talk about. Uh, then there are some very admirable fellows from left to right, the French encyclopedist uh, Diderot and the philosophers Immanuel Kant and Adam Smith. Uh, the latter ironically famously uh, remembered for his early contributions to the then virtually non-existent field of economics. Um, he was actually a moral philosopher. Um, Kant, meanwhile, in an essay entitled uh, Perpetual Peace, a Philosophical Sketch, essentially outlined a League of Nations style system where independent states united under a system of international law, swearing mutual respect for each other's sovereignty, resolving conflicts peacefully while promoting collective security. Uh, it would be a couple of centuries before anyone tried it, however. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, one final note before we wrap up today, and this is with regards to slavery. Because although your reading for this week does include an introduction to the African slave trade, I'm going to move that to next week to talk about that unfortunate institution in the context of Columbus, the Columbian Exchange, the development of transoceanic trade, and emerging globalization. When we pick up Tuesday, then, it will be with Spain as Columbus sets sail. It will possibly, other than our lectures on the long 19th century and the lectures on uh, the two world wars, 
Uh, this might be the single longest lecture, so there's a lot to get to. Uh, I hope to see you then. Thanks.